Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, which hosts Bang and Dang. Moving on to uh, another... Well, three battles. And uh, one story covering the draft riots of NYC, which if you've seen um, Gangs of New York, they got a little scene of it Never in that it. Uh, movie. Never seen it. Tammany Hall, which we uh, have covered in our Outlaws and Gunslingers uh, five points game. where he was wearing a mask and stuff? No. What was that one? Mask? Yeah. Who? Leonardo DiCaprio. No, that was, wasn't that the man behind the Iron Mask or oh, something like that's that? that's what it was, sorry. Didn't see that one either. Gangs of New York, though. Good. Uh, yeah. So we'll have the draft riots plus three other battles, them being the first battle of Fort Wagner, not the uh, most famous one with the 54th. Uh, Cox Plantation and Grimble's Landing, besides um, the draft riots as well. First off, starting off with first battle of Wagner Fort. <laughs> that was a tough fort if you guys watched the movie Glory. Uh, they had to climb up a freaking sand hill, basically, and there's no way. And they had the bombardments on the bottom. What they call those? Batteries? The spikes. Oh, man. I'm sure we'll see. Uh, first battle of Fort Wagner fought July 10th and 11th on Morris Island in Charleston Harbor in early June of 1863. Union Brigadier General Quincy Gilmore replaced Major General David Hunter as commander of the Department of the South. Gilmore, an Army engineer, had successfully captured Fort Pulaski in April of 1862. He began preparations for capturing Moore's Island and parts of James Island, which dominated the southern approaches to Charleston Harbor. If Union artillery could be placed in those locations, they could assist in the bombardment of Fort Sumter, who they're still trying to get that back, whose guns prevented the U.S. Navy from entering the harbor. 10th of July, Union shot artillery on Folly Island, which had been occupied in April of 1863, and naval gunfire from Rear Admiral John Dahlgren's four ironclad warships. They bombarded the Confederate defenses, protecting the southern end of Morris Island. This provided cover for the landing of Brigadier General George Strong's brigade, which crossed Lighthouse Inlet and landed at the southern tip of the island. Strong's troops advanced, capturing several batteries moving about three miles to within range of Fort Wagner, also known as Battery Wagner. It was a heavily gunned redoubt that covered nearly the entire width of the northern end of Morris Island, facing Sumter. Ooh. Well, Strong's report described the advance. He says the two columns now move forward under a lively discharge of shell, grape, and canister converging toward the works uh, nearest the southern extremity of the island and thence along its commanding ridge and eastern coast, capturing successively the eight batteries of one heavy gun each. Wow. Um, occupying the commanding points of that ridge besides two batteries mounting together three 10 inch seacoast mortars. All right, good for you, Strong. July 11th. Strong's brigade attacked at dawn, advancing through a thick fog, attempting to seize Fort Wagner. Although the men of the 7th Connecticut Infantry overran a line of rifle pits, they were repulsed by a 1,770-man force under Confederate Robert, I mean, Colonel Robert Graham. Heavy artillery fire from Fort Wagner prevented other units from joining the attack. Yeah, it's a fort, guys. Right. Uh, Union casualties at this were 339, 49 killed, 123 wounded, 167 missing. Confederate only had 12 altogether. Mm. The first battle of Fort Wagner was followed on July 16th by assaults on James Island and July 18th by the famous but also unsuccessful second battle of Fort Wagner, which uh, we'll cover next episode, actually. That's sad what they did to the 54th there. Yeah, what are you going to do? But they wanted to. They actually weren't going to even be... They're going to come up the rear as a, a reserve. Yeah, well, we'll get there next uh, oh. <laughs> next episode, man. Okay. May 2008. Whoa, damn, that's a long-ass war. <laughs> <laughs> May 2008, TPL and partners including South Carolina Conservation Bank, the South Carolina State Ports Authority, the Civil War Trust, and its divisions under the American Battlefield. Um, it, what is a division under the American Battlefield Trust? And many, many, many private donors. They purchased the island on behalf of the city of Charleston from Ginn Resorts for oh, Ginn Resorts million dollars. You're not telling me that those guys were going to put a resort there. Well, you know it. These guys swooped in as a no, 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 no. Previously, in 2003, when a builder announced his plans to build houses on the track, for which he had an option to buy, the trust local preservationist Blake Hallman 
and others formed the Morse Island Coalition, generated media attention and support for preservation, and defeated the effort. Good for them. Ginn Resorts was interested in buying into, or into developing the property as well, but ultimately decided to purchase it and then immediately sell it to the preservationist. Yeah, because he sold it for a hell of a lot more than what he purchased Well, it for. that or the other dude didn't want to sell it to the preservationists, and maybe these guys are actually good guys, came in and was like, all right, we'll purchase it, we'll sell it to you for what we paid. According to TPL, the city and county are working to complete a management plan to protect the island's nationally significant historical and natural resources. Well, that was 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Probably happened by now. If not. Right. (laughs) Whatever. Next up. Battle of Cox Plantation. Yeah, a bunch of Cox running around there. Uh, it's spelled K O C K, but it's also spelled C O X. Um, and Saint Emma Plantation. It's also called. Okay, it was a battle fought July twelfth to the thirteenth in Ascension Parish, Louisiana. Louisiana been here, ain't been here in a while. It's part of a campaign entitled Taylor's Operations in West Louisiana. Okay, following the surrender of Port Hudson, the two union two union divisions were shifted to Donaldsonville by transports to move inland and pacify the interior. They marched up Bayou Laforge, a division on each bank. Confederate Brigadier General Tom Green, my bum is on your lips, posted a brigade on the east side of the bayou and placed his second brigade on the other side. Fantastic. See, they, it took them a little while to try to get the rest of Louisiana, but they had to, I guess. I guess. I don't know why. Right. As the Union forces advanced, skirmishing occurred on the 11th and 12th of July, the morning of the 13th. A foraging detachment set out along the both banks of the bayou. Upon reaching Cox Plantation, they met rebel skirmishers that forced them back. Then, Green's Confederates flung their might against the Union troops, which kept retiring, although they tried to make stands at various points. The Union troops eventually fell back to the protection of the guns in Fort Butler at Donaldsonville, about six miles from the Cox Plantation. Jeez, dude, how long were the, how far those guns shoot? A small, a much smaller rebel force had routed the Yankees. The expedition failed leaving the Confederates in control of the interior. Estimated casualties, 463 total. U.S., 430. Uh, Confederate States, 33. Hmm. The restored plantation house built in 1847 by a leading sugar planter is maintained as a private museum filled with period furnishings. Oh, that's nice. Cool. It is located on Highway 1, south near Donaldsonville. Well, it's not maintained because the picture don't show that it's maintained. Line bastards. Um, New York City draft riots. Uh oh. Which we touched on, I think, a few episodes ago. They mentioned it. Um, for something, can't remember what it was, but uh, July 16th or July 13th through the 16th, sometimes referred as the Manhattan draft riots and known. Why would uh, they even want to do that? The, the U.S. already knows they got the, hand, the war in hand. Well, whatever. I don't know. It's also known as, uh, at the time, it was known as draft week which were violent disturbances in lower Manhattan, widely regarded as the culmination of white working-class discontent with new laws passed by Congress that year to draft men to fight the ongoing war. Uh, yeah, because they were opposed to white guys getting drafted. Well, plus, apparently, in Manhattan, New York, they are like, we don't want nothing. They're all we rich. We want you guys to win that war. Right. The riots remain the largest civil and most racially charged urban disturbance in American history. Oh, shit. And it reminds you that the uh, Tulsa race right. riot happened, and that was huge. Right. New York's economy was tied to the South, obviously. By 1822, nearly half of his exports were cotton shipments. Mm-hmm. In addition, upstate textile mills pre- pre- uh, process cotton and manufacturing. That's why, right here. I, I bet you more people in New York probably was for the South, to be right. honest with you. And this is why, right here, the Civil War was not over slavery. Well, entirely. Right. Because the North loved what the Souths were doing. And... If uh, if much of the North wasn't a bunch of fucking uh, businessmen or stuff like that who really didn't need slavery. Dude, if the South had factories and industrialized like the North did, they probably would have won. Most likely. The war. Right. For sure. If we if the South would have had uh, like Pennsylvania or let's say uh, something Not like, even that. A, a state Just, like that join them. Dude, it just whoever over. they... It would have been over with. Just 
Because well, Pennsylvania was wherever they were. If they Pennsylvania had, was running shit. If they had in- industries like the North did, they would have won. Yeah, it was all Pennsylvania, Ohio. I mean, I guess, though, because the South was all farmlands, pretty right. much. They're, like I said. And then they relied on the North to process it, and that's what they sold it to. So. Right. Like I said, if they, they kind of screwed themselves by trying would, to go to. If they would have had, like, the southern half of Pennsylvania come with them, like Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and uh, um, Fred- Fredericksburg, right? Anything that's a burg is in Pennsylvania. Right. So. <laughs> if they would have had those guys come with them, dude, it would have been a whole totally different story. Because mm-hmm. then they would have had the uh, factories and stuff to build the shit they needed. Weapons of war and shit like that, you know what I'm saying? Could be a very different uh, country. I don't think it'll exactly, it be exactly the same. I don't think so. Think so. You think there'll still be slavery, the South one? Well, there wouldn't be today. No, I don't think so. Definitely not. Uh, you know how long you think it would have took to eradicate it? Probably not long after, seeing how everybody in the world had already done it or was working on it. They'll start paying the people that actually live indentured servants or right. something if they want to stay they get paid or you can start selling white people too just to make it even or just hire people to do the damn job <laughs> uh, why would you want to pay people why would you want to pay people <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is well it's not funny because I guess what would have been more though what would have been more paying these guys it was 1860 something paying them, paying them like, like five nothing cents, five cents a week or something uh, paying them or housing them and feeding them and doing all the shit that they had to do with slaves anyways. Right. So much money were they actually spending to keep slaves they rather actually, than paying them and then having them go home. They actually did that in the North. They housed them and fed them and all that shit for all the services. They didn't pay them no money. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe they got like a stipend or each month or something. And anyway, only 1% of Southerners even own slaves. So, Well, we, it was 3% or 15% or something like that. Yeah, right. yeah. Or 1% of the whole United States. Right. No, it was like... <laughs> 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 we just looked it up. It was more than that. But it wasn't very many. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it was out of the whatever millions of Confederates who lived in the Confederate States, I think only 120,000 people owned slaves. Right. Which is... Yeah, it was like 3% or something like that. Either one. Right. New York has such strong business connections to the South that on January 7th, 1861, Mayor Fernando Wood, a Democrat, obviously, called on the city's board of aldermen to declare the city's independence from Albany and from Washington. Oh, Oh. damn. See? I bet you a lot of cities. This is even before everybody seceded in the nation. Right. He said uh, it would have the whole and united support from the southern states. Of course it would, but you're... Way isolated. Help, right? <laughs> yeah, you can. You have our support, but we'll get there in uh, two weeks. We'll never get there. <laughs> right. When the Union entered the war, New York City had many sympathizers with the South. The city was also a continuing destination of immigrants. Of Obviously, course. since the forties, most were uh, from Ireland and Germany. In eight, in eighteen sixty, nearly twenty five percent of New York population was German born, Damn. and uh, many did not speak English. Damn. During the 40s and 50s, journalists had published sensational accounts directed at white working class, dramatizing the evils of interracial socializing, relationships, and marriages. Oh, shit. <sighs> you white people, all these uh, right. all these immigrants coming in, stay away from them. Right. Reformers joined the effort. Newspapers carried derogatory portrayals of black people and ridiculed black aspirations for equal rights in voting, education, and employment. I mean, come on. Hey, what's changed? Nothing. <laughs> Still the old same old Democratic Party. Democratic these guys. Yep, the Democratic Party's Tammany Hall political machine. Oh, we heard Tammany Hall in our other show. And uh, Five Points game. All right. Yeah. The Democratic Party Tammany Hall political machine had been working to enroll immigrants as United States citizens so they could vote in the local elections. <laughs> Damn, Democrats ain't changed, have they? All the same. And had strongly recruited the Irish. March 1863, with the war continuing on, Congress passed the Enrollment Act to establish a draft for the very first time in the country's history. As more troops were needed to fight the the uh, the Rebs, even though the Rebs were beat down, New York City and other locations, new citizens loined. They were expected to register for the draft to fight for their country. That they just Why would came. you want these guys that just came? Well, a lot of them probably will. No. Hell no. They're not even loyal to your country yet. All right. They just got here. They don't give a shit. Right. Black men were excluded from the draft that they were largely not considered human beings. I'm sure they didn't care at this point for the draft anyway. And wealthier white men could pay for substitutes. And that a bitch. 
New York political offices, including the mayor, were historically held by Democrats before the war, but the election of Lincoln as president had demonstrated the rise in Republican political power nationally. Yeah, because all the Democrats were right. Southern sympathizers. Uh, newly elected New York City Republican Mayor George Opdyke was mirrored in profiteering scandals in the months after uh, leading up to the riots. The Emancipation, Proclamation, <laughs> the Emancipation Proclamation of January of 1863 alarmed much of the white working class in New York, who feared that freed slaves would migrate to the city and add further competition to the labor market. Exactly. There had already been tensions between black and white workers since the ever, uh, <laughs> right. particularly at the docks, right. with free blacks and immigrants competing for low-wage jobs in the city. Yeah. Mm, March bad. 1863, white longshoremen refused to work with black laborers and rioted, attacking 200 black men. Dang. There were reports of rioting in Buffalo as well, and certain other cities. But the first drawing of draft numbers on the 11th of July, 1863, it occurred peacefully. Peaceably. Peaceably. Peaceably? Peaceably, sure. Peacefully in uh, Manhattan. The second drawing was held on Monday, 13th of July, 1863, 10 days after the Union victory at Gettysburg. 10 a.m., a furious crowd of around 500, led by the volunteer fireman of Engine Company 33, known as the Black Joke. They, Dude, I'm pretty sure that company... Still exists. They might have had one of the highest deaths in 9-11. Oh, wow. They attacked the Assistant 9th District Provost Marshal's office at 3rd Avenue and 47th Street, where the draft was taking place. Mm. Oh, man. They threw large paving stones through windows, burst through the doors, and set the building ablaze. Damn. When the fire department responded, rioters broke up their vehicles. <laughs> broke up? Yeah. <laughs> they just ripped the vehicle apart with their bare hands. <laughs> Others, what? What did they have? It was like carriages, probably. Right. Uh, others killed horses that were pulling treat cars and smashed the cars. Jeez. To prevent other parts of the city being uh, notified of the riot, rioters cut telegraph lines. Nice. Since the New York State Militia had been sent to assist Union troops at Gettysburg, the local New York Metropolitan Police Department was the only force on hand to try to suppress the riot. And they weren't. Police Superintendent John Kennedy hmm. arrived on the site on Monday to check on the situation. <laughs> check it out. Yeah, looks like a riot. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it looks like a riot to me. Oh, man. There's a situation for sure. Although he was not in uniform, people in the mob recognized him, and they attacked him. <laughs> Kennedy was left nearly unconscious, oh, his no. face bruised and cut, his eye injured, his lips swollen, his hand cut with a knife. Well, good thing it was only his hand. He had been beaten to a mass of bruises and blood all over his body. Damn. Police... Police drew their clubs and revolvers and charged the crowd, but they were overpowered. The police were badly beaten, outnumbered, and unable to quill the riots. But they kept the rioting out of Lower Manhattan, below Union Square. They can't go into the Mm-mm. what happened over in California with the one riots, the, the, oh, the zoot suits. L.A. riots, or the L.A. riots. Yeah, they, they blocked uh, off the blocked off the white neighborhoods and, and shit. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing happened in uh, Tulsa. Man, it happened since the bloody sixth ward. Around the South Street Seaport and Five Points area, refrain from involvement in the rioting. Because they're gangs and they were with Tammany Hall and right. The 19th Company, the 1st Battalion U.S. Army Invalid Corps, which was part of the Provost Guard, tried to disperse the mob with a volley of gunfire. Damn. But were overwhelmed and suffered 14 injured with one soldier missing. <laughs> they took that some bitch off somewhere to beat him to death. Mm-hmm. Believed to be killed. Wow. The Bulls Head Hotel on 44th Street, which refused to provide alcohol to the rioters, was burned. The mayor's residence on 5th Avenue was spared by the words of Judge George Gardner Bernard, and the crowd of about 500 people turned to another location of pillage. I wonder what he said. He probably said, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> the 8th and 5th District Police Stations, is he German? What's his name? Bernard? Barnard? It was an American lawyer from New York. It was one of the- Oh, he's one of only four people ever tried by New York court for the trial of impeachments. Well, the one a good guy, huh? He was born of... Graduated uh, from Yale. Frederick and Margaret Bernard must have been born. Well, he was a Tammany Hall guy. The 8th and 5th Street District Police Stations and other buildings were attacked and set on fire as well. Other targets included the office of the New York Times. The mob was turned back at the Times office by staff manning Gatlin guns. Holy shit, where the hell did New York Times get Gatlin guns? <laughs> Uh, including the New York Times founder Henry Jarvis Raymond on these guns. He's like, screw you guys. Fire engine companies responded, but some firefighters were sympathetic to the rioters because they had also been drafted on Saturday. They're like, screw it. New York Tribune. It was attacked. It was, it, it was looted and boined. Not until police arrived and extinguished the flames was the crowd dispersed. Later in the afternoon, authorities shot and moited a man as a crowd attacked the armory of the 2nd Avenue and 21st Street. Yeah, you can't be having them go to the armory. 
The mob broke all the windows with paving stones ripped from the street. The mob beat, tortured, and moited numerous black civilians, including one man who was attacked by a crowd of 400 with clubs and paving stones. Damn. Then they, then they hung him from a tree and set alight. Oh, Jeez. my. There's a picture of that out there somewhere. Uh, the Colored Orphan Asylum uh, at 43, 43rd Street and 5th Avenue, which was a symbol of white charity to blacks and of black upward mobility. That provided shelter for 233 children was attacked by a mob at around 4 p.m. Oh, vicious Germans. All right. A mob of several thousand, including many women and children, looted the building of its food and supplies. I bet. Yeah. They tell the women and children, go get the food right. and supplies. However, the police were able to secure the orphanage for enough time to allow the orphans to escape before the building burned down. Dang. Jeez. So now you got 233 kids just right. nowhere. Running around, stealing from Right. Throughout the areas of rioting, mobs attacked and killed numerous black civilians and destroyed their known homes and businesses, such as James McCoon Smith's Pharmacy at 93 West Broadway, believed to be the first owned by a black man in the United States. That's ridiculous. Jeez. Wow. Near the Midtown Docks, tensions brewing since the mid-1850s, they boiled over finally. As recently as March 1863, white employers had hired black longshoremen, with whom many white men refused to work. Rioters went into the streets in search of all the Negro porters, cartmen, and laborers to attempt to remove all evidence of a black and interracial social life from the area near the docks. What is people's problems? Right. Like, what the hell does it matter who you're working with? I mean, jeez, right. dude. And they went as far as interracial. Jeez. Yeah. That's that. That's that. Uh, black. That's that black fucker. Um, a black fucker. We can't have am, we can't have we can't have any evidence of white people mingling with black people in this right. in this area. Jeez. White dock workers attacked and destroyed brothels, dance halls, boarding houses, tenements that catered to black people. Mobs stripped the clothing off the white owners of these businesses. Right. Oh, it's the white people that own the business, right. of course. <laughs> uh, heavy rain fell on Monday night, helping to abate the fires and send rioters home. But the crowds returned the next day. So we ain't done. They burned down the home of Abby Gibbons, who was a prison reformer and the daughter of abolitionist Isaac Hopper. Oh, man. They uh, also attacked white amalgamationists, such as Ann Derrickson and Ann Martin, two white women who were married to black men, and Mary Burke, a white prostitute who catered to black men. Oh, wow. Damn, dude. Yeah. Governor Horatio Seymour arrived on Tuesday and spoke at City Hall, where he attempted to, uh, to calm down the crowd by proclaiming that the Conscription Act was unconstitutional. So they can't do this, guys. General John E. Wool, commander of the Eastern District, brought approximately 800 soldiers and Marines in from forts in uh, New York Harbor, West Point, and Brooklyn Navy Hard Yard. He ordered the militias to return to New York. So we got this. The situation improved July 15th when Assistant Provost Marshal General Robert Nugent received word from his superior officer, Colonel James Barnett Fry, to postpone the draft. Ooh, I bet. As this news appeared in newspapers, some rioters stayed home. <laughs> but some of the militias began to return and use harsh measures against the remaining rioters. Oh, shit. The rioting spread to Brooklyn and Staten Island. Wow. Well, order began to be restored on the 16th of July. The New York State militia had some, and some federal troops were returned to New York, including the 152nd New York Volunteers, the 26th Michigan Volunteers, 27th Indiana, the 7th Regiment New York State Militia from Fredericksburg, Maryland. Or just Frederick. Right. Oh, yeah. From Frederick, Maryland. And they did that after a forced march. Damn, dude. Ooh. They went there in force. They were like, we're right. going to do some shit. And they're yeah. like, oh, man, we got to go back. Ah, shit. How about we don't do a forced march back? <laughs> <laughs> a leisure march. In addition, the governor sent in the 74th and 65th regiments of New York State Militia, which had not been in federal service, and a section of the 20th Independent Battery, uh, New York Volunteer Artillery from Fort Schuyler in Throg's Neck. The, wherever that's at. In New York, clearly. The New York State militia units were the first to arrive. Well, there were several thousand militia and federal troops in the city at this time. A final confrontation occurred in the evening uh, near Gramercy Park. According to the Adrian Cook, <laughs> 12 people died on this last day of the riots and skirmishes between the rioters, police, and the army. That's when all the bad shit happens, when they want the shit to get over with. Right. So like... We got to do what we got to do. New York Times reported on Thursday that Plug Uglies and uh, Blood Tubs gang members from Baltimore, as well as School Kill, Squeakill Rangers, 
and other rowdies of Philadelphia, quote-unquote, had come to New York during their unrest to participate in the riots alongside the Dead Rabbits and the uh, Macro Villers. Oh, shit. The Times editorialized that, uh, editorialized that the scoundrels cannot afford to miss this golden opportunity of indulging their brutal natures and oh. at the same time serving their colleagues, which are the Copperheads and the Secessionist Sympathizers. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> Look at that shit. Right. All these people, all these gangs around are like, dude, there's rioting up there. Let's go. Right. Hell yeah. Wow. The exact de- the exact death toll during New York draft riots is unknown, but according to historian James McPherson, 119 or 120 people were murdered. Although other estimates list the death toll as as high as 1,200. Oh shit! Violence by longshoremen against black men were especially fierce in dock areas. You know, when people died there, they didn't count. <laughs> Threw them in the water. <laughs> all right, man. The- West Broadway below 26. All was quiet at nine o'clock last night. A crowd was at the corner of 7th Avenue and 27th Street at that time. This was the scene of the hanging of a Negro in the morning and another at 6 o'clock in the evening. The body of the one hung in the morning presented a shocking appearance at the station house. His fingers and toes had been sliced off, and there was scarcely an inch of flesh which was not gashed. Wow. Jeez. Late in the afternoon, a Negro was dragged out of his house in West 27th Street, beaten down on the sidewalk, pounded in a horrible manner, and then hanged to a tree. Oh, shit. That's ridiculous. Wow. This is worse than the war itself. <laughs> in all, 11 black men were hanged over five days. Among Jeez. the murdered blacks was a seven-year-old nephew of Bermudan First Sergeant Robert John Simmons of the 54th Massachusetts. Oh, no whose account of fighting in South Carolina written on approach to Fort Wagner was to be published in the New York Tribune on December 23rd. Simmons died in August of wounds received in that attack on Fort Wagner. Damn, he survived? I thought all the 54 died. Mm-mm. Oh, shit. There wasn't even really that many. There's probably 500. No, that died? No. The whole 54 died? No, not even, not even close. Are you sure? Yes. Most reliable estimates indicate that 2,000 people were injured. Herbert Asbury, the author of the 1928 book Gangs of New York, upon which the 2002 film was based on, pushed the figure much higher at about 2,000 killed, which is probably right, maybe more. I'd say at least a grand, dude. Like we said, the people at the docks and all that stuff that nobody knew about. They ain't going to put that in as the riots. They only figured in what was in that center area. Well, either that or did they count? A lot of black people that were killed, first of all. Right. Yeah. And he also says there were about 8,000 wounded, a, a number that is still at dispute. Total property damage was about 1 to 5 million, equivalent to 17 to 88 million in 2021. Damn. Oh, jeez. The city treasury later indemnified one quarter of the amount. What does that mean? Probably uh, just ate it, right? There's a contractual obligation of one party. To compensate right. the loss incurred by another party right. due to red of an accident, Demeter, or the duty is not always a close central contractual duty. So the Republican Party took the loss for the Democrats? Mm-hmm. Wow. History Samuel Elliott Morrison, he wrote that the riots were equivalent to a Confederate victory. Well, pretty much, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> These guys did more damage than the freaking <laughs> Confederates would have. 50 buildings, including two Protestant churches and the Colored Orphan Asylum, were burned to the ground. As they were, 4,000 federal troops had to be pulled out of the Gettysburg campaign to suppress the riots, troops that could have aided in pursuing the uh, battered Army of Northern Virginia as it retreated out of Union territory. Ain't that some shit? Yeah, those guys didn't have to run out. Right. They passed Robert E. Lee. Yeah, they're like, no, we got to go to New York, sorry. <laughs> we got to get you. We'll get you later, bud. <laughs> During the riots, landlords, fearing that the mob would destroy their buildings, drove black residents from their homes. Yeah, you got to get the hell out of here. They're going right. to burn our shit down. As a result of the violence against them, hundreds of blacks left New York, obviously, including physician James McCune, Smith, and his family. Well, at least the uh, pharmacy got burned down. Right. right. What's he got? Uh, he moved to Williamsburg and Brooklyn. Or in New Jersey somewhere. It's one of those three. <laughs> Where did he go? They don't know, obviously. Oh, he was a pre- he was a physician at the Colored Orphan Asylum uh, oh, for a minute. He is. Of course he's uh, Both Smith and his wife were of mixed African and European descent. Oh, so it wasn't even full. We've got more of a story than the freaking... Oh, it says Williamsburg up there. Later year, 63 years appointed the uh, professor's anthropology at Wilberforce College. Which is the first African American owned and operate college in New York. He was, he was, he was too ill to take the position and died two years later in 1865. 
from congestive heart failure, and it's in Ohio. So we went to Ohio. Damn. Well, it's going to anyways. Oh, shit. He's leaving Brooklyn, so I'm going to Ohio, baby. And he died, though, two years later. Damn. The white elite in New York organized to provide relief to black riot victims, helping them find new work and homes. Surprisingly. The Union League Club and the Committee of Merchants for the Relief of Colored People provided nearly 40,000 to 2,500 victims of the riots. That's a lot of money. By 1865, the black population in the city had dropped to under 10,000, the lowest since 1820. The white working class riots had changed the demographics of the city. White residents exerted their control in the workplace. They became unequivocally divided from the blacks. Hmm. Wow. August 19th, the government resumed the draft in New York. <laughs> it, comp- it was completed in 10 days without further incident. Wow. Fewer men were drafted than had been feared by the white working class. Of the 750,000 selected nationwide for conscri- conscription, only about 45,000 were sent into active duty. Wow. Still a lot. Yeah. While the rioting mainly involved the white working class, middle and upper class New Yorkers had split sentiments on the draft and use of federal power or martial law to enforce it. Oh, shit. Many wealthy Democratic businessmen sought to have the draft declared unconstitutional. Uh, of course they did. Tammany Democrats did not seek to have the draft declared unconstitutional, but they helped pay the com- commutation fees for those who were drafted. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> December 1863, the Union League Club recruited more than 2,000 black soldiers. They outfitted and trained them, honoring and sending off with a parade through the city to the Hudson River docks in March of 1864. A crowd of 100,000 people watched the procession, which was led by police and members of the Union League Club. Look at that. Look at that. New York's support for the Union cause continued, however grudgingly, and gradually Southern sympathies declined in the city. Yeah, because of murder or ran off. New York banks eventually financed the Civil War. And the state's industries were more productive than those of the entire Confederacy. Oh, jeez. That's what I was just saying. By the end of the war, more than 450 soldiers, sailors, and militia had enlisted from New York State, which was the most populous state at the time. Still is. A total of 46,000 military men from New York State died during the war. Damn. More from disease than wounds, though, as was typical of most combatants. Mm hmm. And that is the draft riots. Wow. That was a rough one there. uh, some shit happening over there. Huh? New York's has been New York for since New York right, since existed. New York was New York. Yes. <laughs> All right, Battle of Grimble's Landing, which took place on James Island, South Carolina, July sixteenth, to draw Confederate forces away from reinforcing Fort Wagner. Brigadier General Quincy Gilmore designed two feints. One force was sent up to Stono River to threaten the Charleston and Savannah Railroad Bridge. Second one consisted of Albert Terry's division landed on James Island on July 8th. Soon, Terry demonstrated his forces before the Confederate defenses, but did not launch an attack. He's like, hey, this is what we can do. Right. July 11th, Gilmore made his move on Fort Wagner. The attack was made by the 7th Connecticut Infantry. Okay, supported by a heavy naval bombardment, the assault jumped off at dawn, moved forward through a thick morning fog, which helped to conceal their advance. The attackers were met with stiff resistance and were forced back with heavy losses. The regiment lost 330, 339 men with 123 wounded, 49 moited, and 167 gone, missing. We don't know where they're at. Against this, the defenders suffered 12 casualties. Wow. Gilmore considered his next move. He's like, man, what am I going to do now? Meanwhile, the Confederates moved against James Island. On July 16th, they attacked with the goal of encircling and destroying a part of the Union force there. The men of the 10th Connecticut Infantry were in an exposed position and in jeopardy of being cut off. The Confederate efforts to get around them were checked by the men of the 54th Massachusetts, who rebuffed a series of attacks while the 10th Connecticut was withdrawn. The 54th suffered 43 casualties, 14 killed, 17 wounded, and 12 others lost the capture. But the 10th Connecticut was saved. The following day, the Union forces were pulled off the island. They said, you got to get out of there. Right. The battle was the first engagement of... The uh, historic and famed 54th Massachusetts that, Infantry Regiment. That battle is also in the movie Glory. Yes, it's it is. Pretty good one. You should check it out. A letter to his wife written two days later by First Sergeant Robert John Simmons, who was also in the British Army, shortly before the attack on Battery Army was published in the New York Times. Nope, New York Tribune on the 23rd of December, 1863, giving a first-hand account of the action at Folly Island, South Carolina. It says, July 18, 1863. We are on the march to Fort Wagner to storm it. 
we have just completed our successful retreat from James Island. We fought a desperate battle there Thursday morning. Three companies of us, the B, H, and K, were out on a picket about a good mile in advance of the regiment. We were attacked early in the morning. Our company was in the reserve when the outposts were attacked by rebel infantry and cavalry. I was sent out by our captain in command of a squad of men to support the left flank. The bullets fairly rained around us. When I got there, the poor fellows were falling down all around me with pitiful groans. Hmm. Our pickets only numbered about 250 men, and they were attacked by 900. It is supposed by the line of battle in the distance that they were supported by the reserve of 3,000 men. We had to fire and retreat toward our own encampment. One poor sergeant of ours was shot down alongside me. Several others wounded near me. God has protected me through this, my first fiery, laden trial, and I do give him to the glory and render my praises unto his holy name. My poor friend, Sergeant Peter Vogelsang, is shot through the lungs. His case is critical, but the doctor says he may probably live. Okay. His company suffered very much. Poor good and brave Sergeant Joseph D. Wilson of his company H, after killing four rebels with his bayonet, was shot through the head by the fifth one. Poor fellow. Hmm. May his noble spirit rest in peace. The general has complimented the colonel on the gallantry and bravery of his regiment. At roughly the same time, <laughs> at roughly the same time as his events that the first Sergeant Simmons described took place, his seven-year-old nephew was moitered. In New York during the four days of race riots oh, dude, that, that followed seven -year -old. the 13th of July, wow. 1863. With that note, wow, oh, dude. End this episode. With that was some crazy stuff there. Man, that was the most brutal shit we've seen in the Civil War. Those draft riots, man. And wasn't even technically a battle, but uh, Grimble's Landing and the first battle of Fort Wagner um, setting the stage for... The more popular one, which we'll have next week, as we'll cover Honey Springs and in Indian Territory, uh, Charleston Harbor number two, and Fort Wagner number two, which is obviously the one that uh, the 54th met his demise and its heroism. Yeah, that's going to do it. We'll have that uh, next week. In the meantime, uh, mean team, go check out our uh, other series we just started, other podcasts we just started according to Wikipedia, where we read random Wikipedia articles so we don't have to. We just wrapped up part two of our article on Wikipedia, where Wikipedia really loved freaking talking about themselves in that damn uh, thing. And yeah, I'm glad that it was over with. We, yeah, that was just all we heard about was, is Wikipedia reliable? How many editors does Wikipedia have? Well, Wikipedia's editors are uh, declining, <laughs> pretty much. And then, uh, obviously, uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers, where we're still in the middle of the mafia, which next week's, oh, this week's episode covered uh, two guys who took over for Vito Genovese while he was in prison. Um, Anthony Strollo and Thomas Ebeli next week will cover three other guys that were like kind of in the same position. Gerardo Catina, Michele uh, Miranda, and Phil Lombardo, who actually became the big boss for about 15 years after that. So, right. You wouldn't know it, though. Right, because there's not much information on these guys. That's the way the Genovese family liked it. But, uh, yeah, all those are on wherever you get your podcast, plus on YouTube at Bang Dang Network every Monday Tuesday and Friday for all these. And uh, we'll see you next week for most notably the second battle of Fort Wagner. We'll be back then with Mouth of Michiganers with Bing Dang. Bang.